I got lots to say, so you got you can sit sit down for lots a while. Lots to say, but why? Because I have it. Hello, is this working? Is it working? It worked for me. It worked for him. He said, "It works, right?" Okay. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Doris Rankin, and I am a member of the committee for the community uh, speaker series. Um, the series itself is planned by representatives of the three Pakenham churches and the Pakenham and District Civitan Club. And we have a little bit of history. We started our little project in 2019, and we're going great guns until COVID. So uh, we started up again uh, last month and had a very successful uh, speaker. So, um, and we're on again tonight and then we'll uh, uh, reconvene after the winter months so we won't be dragging people out um, in the, when we have more nights like tonight, but even worse. So just to give you a heads up who we've got lined up to come in the spring, we've got uh, Emma Moxley who is a local travel agent, and she's going to touch on post-COVID uh, tra travel situation um, internationally as well as uh, Canada-wide, and she'll be emphasizing the importance of insurance and the convenience of using a travel agent to plan your, your best trips. So we're looking forward to having her. And we're also going to have Lorraine Downey, who is our very own uh, Pakenham paramedic, and she'll bring us up to date on the working world of uh, paramedics and how um, these health professionals are stepping out of their traditional roles and using their expertise to be more involved with preventative measures in the health field, thank God. So um, we just want you to know if you have any topics or know of great speakers that you'd like to suggest, uh, you can speak to any one of our committee members. So there's myself, Joan Gillen, uh, Dave Wilson are here tonight, and Bonnie McFarland. So just let us know if you know of anybody who has uh, something we'd like to hear about. Um, we've also uh, provided a donation plate at the back door. If you'd like to contribute, there's no, these sessions are free. And that's the whole idea. We want just to, um, have uh, something that people can come out to. It doesn't cost any money. You can get to see your neighbors. Um, but we have a few operating uh, expenses, so if you feel that you'd like to contribute, and it has no relation to how good the talk is. <laughs> so it's not like a review, you know? Um, so um, before we start, though, I have to give, uh, <clears throat> you know, the standard uh, uh, lecture about putting your phones on mute so that uh, we can enjoy the talk. So tonight it gives me great pleasure to introduce Robert Gardner uh, to talk about uh, Pakenham history at the turn of the century, a village in transition. Uh, Robert uh, has written a book, for those of you who don't know, on the history of Pakenham and uh, he'll be highlighting some of uh, the little tidbits in the in that tonight. So Robert grew up in Pakenham and was brought up by his incredible mother <laughs> and uh, his father, Lyman Gardner. Um, and Robert has always uh, had a keen interest in history and in writing. And in fact, today I just went to grab some paper to write this, and I, on the cover it said Robert Gardner, Grade One. And I opened it up, and it was a story that he'd written. And the first line was, in grade one, once there lived a boy who loved to explore. But I was in the story, but by grade three, I, had, I was only appearing as a ghost. <laughs> and the name of the story was The Skeleton. So that was even before The Walking Dead. Anyway, Robert is a graduate of Queen's University with a degree in economics with uh, a huge emphasis in history on, in, with his minor courses. And he currently works in the commercial real estate industry and ha obviously has taken to writing uh, Pakenham history on the side. 
and maybe if we hadn't had COVID, he wouldn't be as far as he, far enough, far along as he is today. So uh, I just want to say, following Robert's talk, there'll be a question and answer period, and they are recording tonight. Um, so if you have a question, we would like if you could come to the mic so it gets, uh, we can hear it on the recording. And afterwards, um, there will be some refreshments served in the uh, room over here and some uh, cookies and sweets. So you can um, talk to each other, talk to Robert, and uh, hopefully we'll you know, have a nice little social um, get together afterwards. So thank you for coming and Robert. <laughs> it's kind of important. Uh, well, thanks, Mom. <laughs> uh, yeah, so tonight, uh, obviously, I'm going to be talking about Pakenham at the turn of the century. And the reason why I chose this particular time period to talk about was because it was really Pakenham's heyday. Uh, it was really the last time that Pakenham was uh, a larger industrial town. Uh, and following around 1910, uh, it would decline into a much smaller town uh, like the one we know today. Uh, and before the 1890s, uh, there was a recession, uh, and so Pakenham enjoyed about 20 years of prosperity. Uh, and so here you see a, a graph of the population of Pakenham Township from when it was first settled in 1823 uh, up until just after amalgamation uh, in 2001. Uh, so the population of Pakenham Township peaked in around 1861 uh, at 2,400 people. Uh, the village had 800 people, uh, which at the time would have made it larger than Arnprior. Uh, so it was quite the large industrial center. Um, but beginning after that, the population would decline for over 100 years until the 70s. And it really wasn't until the 70s and the 80s, uh, once the baby boomers started to have their own children. Uh, that the population has grown. Uh, and even at the time of amalgamation uh, in the early 2000s, the population still hadn't recovered. Uh, so this time period, the turn of the century, takes place in the middle of this decline, uh, but afterwards it would really start declining. Uh, in 1891, the population of Pakenham Township was 2,000, uh, and in 1911 it had fallen to 1,600, so about a 20% loss over 20 years. Um, but despite this decline, there was still a lot of development and a lot of growth uh, within the township itself. Uh, for example, uh, in 1901, 15% of houses in the township uh, were a brick or stone construction. Uh, to put that into context, in 1851, so 50 years earlier, 50% uh, of Pakenham residents lived in a one-room log shanty, uh, and there were only five stone houses in the entire township. Uh, so there's quite a bit of uh, increase in living standards. Uh, liter illiteracy, which was very common in 1851, uh, was basically a non-issue by 1901. Almost everyone attended primary school. Uh, I believe there were about eight schoolhouses throughout the township at this time. Uh, high school wasn't, wasn't so common, but primary school was. Um, and despite these developments and despite this uh, increase in the quality of life, uh, it didn't actually improve life expectancy. Uh, so the median age in 1901 uh, was in the low to mid 20s, uh, and 90% of Pakenham residents were younger than 55. To put that under, into perspective, uh, the most recent census in 2021, the, uh, the median age, the average age of a Mississippi Mills resident was 50. Uh, so quite, quite an increase uh, in the average age. Um, but really what I want to do tonight is just show you what it would, would have been like to live in Pakenham in this time period. Uh, so here we have a map of Pakenham uh, that was done originally in 1897 and it was updated uh, every five years afterwards. Uh, and so I really just want to look back on what the village was like uh, 120 years ago. Uh, so here we have zoomed in to Dalkeith and Graham Streets. Graham, of course, being an older name for the main street. Uh, for some of those older residents would know that. Uh, and the first thing you might see is a town hall on Dalkeith Street uh, by the cemetery. That was a town hall from the 1850s up until about 1908 when it burned. 
Uh, and there was also a jail cell in there so they could lock up the town drunk and uh, maybe, some, maybe some timber crews going to, through town who uh, wanted to start a fight. Uh, and you also see a hotel where the feed and seat is today. That was McFarland's Inn. Uh, that was a very popular hotel for about 80 years uh, that stood on that site. Uh, and here you sort of have the main business block. Uh, so you have Elizabeth Street and Wabba Road at, at the bottom and then up to Renfrew Street. Uh, you can see the general store, which is that sort of big blue building. Blue on this map means a building built out of stone. Um, but it's interesting to see what isn't there nowadays, obviously. If you look across the street towards uh, where McCann's and Nicholson's is now, uh, you'll see an agricultural implement store, you see a blacksmith, blacksmith shop, uh, and most of these buildings were destroyed in a big fire in 1939, uh, which is why they're not there today. And further south uh, towards Jesse Street, you had even more businesses. And sort of the main part of town was centered in this area at the time. Uh, there was another big stone general store, almost identical to the one that we have now. Uh, but most of the buildings in this block were destroyed uh, in a fire in 1940. So within a one year period, uh, two entire blocks of the town were destroyed in a big fire. Um, and if you look, uh, you can see where the pharmacy is today. There was a, a tinsmith there. Um, so Pakenham would have looked much different uh, if you had walked down the street uh, around 1900. Uh, and this building I get asked about a lot. This was the original curling club. Uh, so this was built in 1901, uh, and it stood until 1927. Uh, and it was on Victoria Street, which is now McFarland Street, not far from the, where the library is now. Uh, and you can even see the little illustration, but it had a domed roof. Uh, and everyone talks about the domed roof. It was all over the newspapers when it was built. It has a domed roof, it has a domed roof. Uh, and clearly they even, when they redid the map in 1902, you can see they drew the curling club in uh, and they drew the dome over the roof. So uh, that was clearly a big deal in, uh, in the 1900s. Uh, and so this is probably the most famous or most iconic picture uh, of Pakenham from this time period. Uh, and the one thing that a lot of people always comment about when they see uh, these pictures uh, are the houses on the other side of the river. Uh, and of course there were a lot of houses on the other, around the falls uh, at that time. And that's because that's pe where people worked. Uh, and we know that's where people worked because you can see a mill clearly uh, in the bottom left. Uh, that mill was a carding mill or a woolen mill. Um, and there were a bunch of other mills, uh, as we'll see at this time. Um, but a lot of the activity around, in Pakenham, would have been centered around the falls uh, in the 1900s. And here's, of course, another photo. Uh, you can see the carding mill, which is sort of that red one there in the middle. Uh, and then to the right, you have a, uh, a planing mill, which would have made shingles uh, and boards, like two by fours. Uh, and at the very edge there, you have a cheese factory, which closed around 1908. Uh, and up in the cemetery, you have the old Presbyterian Kirk, which was the predecessor to this building, of course. Uh, and here's a bird's eye view of Pakenham, or what would have been a bird's eye view before planes were invented. Um, and a lot of people always comment on this picture about how many buildings there are. It almost looks like it's an entire city. Uh, most of these buildings weren't houses. Uh, they would have been sheds and outbuildings. Uh, most people kept livestock, even if they lived in town then. Uh, they would have had a milk cow, and they would have let the cow out, uh, and then they would have herded it back in whenever they were going to milk it. Uh, and in fact, if you look very closely, you can even see a cow or a horse or some sort of animal uh, drinking from the river. Uh, so even in the middle of town, you would have seen livestock uh, just roaming through the streets. Uh, and so here you have the main street. Uh, obviously, it's very picturesque and cute. Uh, this picture would have been taken at the intersection with Renfrew Street. So that's the general store on the left, sort of behind the trees. Uh, so you would have been sort of looking on the right towards where McCann's and Nicholson's is now. Uh, and again, it looks very quaint, I suppose, right? You have nice peaceful trees, nice bushes. Uh, somebody's out on their horse and buggy going through town, uh, having a grand old time. Uh, and this is what they would have wanted you to think that Pakenham looked like. Uh, this picture was used as a postcard, uh, which is why it's colorized. Uh, and 
it was sort of meant to make Pac-Name look a little better than it was, because at this time what Pac-Name really would have looked like was this. <laughs> um, and they called it Muddy Pac-Name for a reason. Uh, one First World War veteran liked it to Passchendaele. Uh, the mud in the streets uh, was described as a thick chalk, like a plaster. Uh, it got into everything, it got all over your clothes. Uh, the woman in this photo crossing the street there in the background would not be crossing the street on this day. Um, and these photos were taken about a year or two apart, just before the First World War. Uh, so this is what it would have looked like then. Um, one account of the Main Street of this time said that there were two universal ruts and over the course of the spring the ruts would get deeper and deeper and deeper and you can actually see the ruts in this photo. And in case you didn't believe me, you can still see the ruts on the other side of town looking the other way. Um, so this photo was taken at the intersection with Jesse Street. Uh, just over here outside of what's now the old hotel apartments, I believe it's called. So there was more than just Pakenham Village at this time, of course. Uh, this map is from the 1880s, uh, and it shows the entirety of Pakenham Township. Uh, and of course, if you look on this map, you'll see that there's a lot going on in the south uh, towards Cedar Hill, and that's because at this time, uh, Cedar Hill was a bustling community in its own right. Uh, historically, Cedar Hill was very important to the development of Pakenham Township, uh, and that's because the logging industry was centered around Mount Pakenham, uh, and Indian Creek runs right along the south of the mountain. Uh, so if you were up there cutting trees, the quickest way to get them out of there would be to bring them south to the creek, uh, and then you could either put them in the creek and float them down to the river, uh, or you could saw them into boards at the creek. Uh, and there were several sawmills around this time on Indian Creek or in the decades before. Um, the Forsyth family had one, which is where the, uh, the Cedar Hill tree farm is today, uh, and the Bull family had one at one point as well. Uh, and if you contrast that with the northern part of the township along Waba Creek, uh, there was a lot less development. And that's because Waba Creek, it's flatter, it's better farmland, so it's mainly just farms. Uh, but Cedar Hill area, it's more rocky, it's not, it's not as good for farming. So it, it, logging was sort of the main industry. Uh, and at this time, Cedar Hill would have had two schoolhouses, uh, a post office, and uh, some smaller rural industries, like a rural blacksmith and stuff. But there was one other community uh, in rural Pakenham at this time, and that was Unita. Uh, obviously a silly little name, and it got its, it's, got its name from a silly story. Uh, Unita was along Bellamy Road, uh, obviously up near White Lake, sort of in kind of the middle of nowhere, but, but uh, up towards uh, that far corner of the township. Uh, Unita at this time would have had a, a schoolhouse, uh, it had a post office, it had a general store, uh, and maybe a small blacksmith as well. Uh, and you're probably wondering, of course, how did Unita get its name? Uh, names weren't very creative back then. Uh, most towns were named after the post office, not the other way around. Uh, and that's because in the days before rural mail delivery, uh, no one really had an address, right? Because when you mailed something to someone, you, you would just mail it to their local post office, then they, they would have to go and pick it up, the recipient of the letter. Uh, obviously people had lot numbers and concession numbers and stuff, but when you were mailing something, you just mailed it to the local post office. Uh, so that means that the town and the post office would have had to have the same name, uh, or else it would be very confusing, right? It would be very confusing to tell someone, uh, mail this to the Lanark post office, but really you live in Pakenham. Uh, and there's a lot of examples like this. Um, Blakeney used to be called Rosebank. Uh, then they found out there was another Rosebank, so they had to change the name. Uh, and this happened all over the place. I think Clayton had to change its name. Uh, even Pakenham uh, could have had to change its name. Uh, when the post office, when Andrew Dixon opened the first post office, uh, he named it the Pakenham Post Office. Uh, it wasn't named after the village. The, air, the village was called Dixon's Mills at the time, um, but he named it after the township. Uh, and so that's kind of how we became Pakenham, uh, because of the post office. Uh, even Cedar Hill got its name from the post office. Uh, Cedar Hill was the name of the farm in which the post office was built, uh, and more specifically, the house. It was the name of the house, uh, and the post office was just in the summer kitchen of the house. 
Uh, so not, very, not a very sophisticated uh, post office. So that brings us to UNITA. Uh, before UNITA had a post office, there was a teacher. Uh, the, the local school teacher uh, usually wasn't from the same community. Uh, they were usually from somewhere else and they would board with a host family while they were teaching. And this particular teacher was feeling a little bored or a little isolated. She was away from her family and she wanted a connection. Uh, so one day she started to complain and she started to tell people, you need a post office, you need a post office. <laughs> you need a post office. Uh, and so that's how it got its name, or so the story goes. <laughs> Uh, so Unita's heyday was uh, cut a little short. It got its post office around 1910, and by 1914, uh, they were offering rural mail delivery from White Lake. Uh, so its heyday was only about four years or so. But at one point, there was another rural community uh, within Packingham Township. Uh, so this, then, is sort of the quintessential image of Packingham from this time period. You can see all the mills. You can see the new bridge. Uh, you can see the rapids, and of course, you can see uh, what would have been the new Catholic Church towering over the rest of the community. But what really stands out from this image is that big building on the left, uh, that big mill. And when I first saw this picture many years ago, I wondered what that mill was, when it was built, uh, what it did, and when it disappeared. Uh, so really the first topic that I guess I want to talk about tonight, I'll talk about five different stories, I guess, uh, is the story of that mill uh, the Dowd Roller Mill, as it was called. Uh, so the Dowd Roller Mill, Roller Mill was a, a type of grist mill. Uh, it, it basically refined all sorts of grain products, anything from corn to oatmeal uh, to wheat. Uh, it was built in 1895 after the previous mills had burned down. Uh, the previous mills had been purchased by a man named Charles McAllister uh, from Pembroke. Uh, and he was very young, I think 21 or 22 when he bought the mills. Uh, he was a son of a very wealthy uh, mill owner and lumber baron uh, from Pembroke. Uh, and so daddy's money may have been involved when he, when he purchased the mills. Uh, but he purchased the mills in December of 1894. Uh, and five days later, all the mills burned to the ground uh, and he lost everything. Uh, nothing was insured. Uh, so we, he was ruined. Uh, he packed up, uh, moved out west, tried to make a fortune for himself. Uh, and he ended up dying at a very young age out there. Uh, so <laughs> he had a very tragic life story, uh, but it was tragic for the town as well, uh, because of course the mills were the center of the town's economy. So stepping into the breach were two men named George and Jonathan Francis. Uh, they were two brothers uh, who lived in the area. Uh, they had accumulated quite a bit of money uh, from the timber trade earlier in their lives. Uh, and their father was also a big uh, lumber king as well. So they, had, they sort of had family wealth going for them. Uh, and so when they built these mills, this mill specifically, uh, they built it not so much to make money because they sold it not, after, not long after they built it, but they, they did it more as a charitable uh, thing to try and get the, con the economy of the town going because uh, there was really no one else to rebuild the mill. Um, so as I said, uh, the Francis brothers sold the mill uh, and it took off quite fastly, quite quickly. Uh, the mill employed as many as 40 people uh, who worked 10 hours per day, five and a half days per week. Uh, they would work one five hour shift from seven to 12, an hour for lunch, and then they'd be back working from one to six. Uh, the mill changed hands several times until 1902 when it was purchased by the Dowd Milling Company. Uh, the company was owned by Hamilton Stewart Dowd, who was a native of Quion, Quebec. Uh, Dowd built and bought many grist mills throughout Ontario around this time, and he sort of amassed uh, quite a fortune doing so. Uh, at this time, grain was a huge part of the Ontario agricultural economy. Uh, we don't associate stuff like wheat with Ontario nowadays, but at this time, the prairies weren't as developed as they were now. And even though there were people growing wheat on the prairies, it was harder to ship it else, ship it from there, right? Uh, the railroads weren't as developed. Uh, so Ontario was still uh, sort of in, in its heyday of its wheat culture, I guess, of its wheat market. Um, so there was a big market for big mills like this. Uh, and so when Dow, Dow bought the mill, uh, he, bought, he built a large grain elevator um, by the train tracks. Uh, and he was also a bit greedy. 
P lobbied uh, council um, to, to get it so they didn't have to pay property taxes for 10 years or something. Uh, and the council didn't want to do anything with it, so they put it up to referendum. Uh, and needless to say, people weren't happy, uh, <laughs> happy with that. So they voted to uh, make sure that they still paid property taxes. Uh, so Dowd ran, ran the mill until 1910 uh, when he tried to sell it to the Maple Leaf Milling Company. Uh, the Maple Leaf Milling Company was the predecessor of Maple Leaf Foods, which I'm sure everyone's heard of. Uh, and it would have been a very good thing for the town. Uh, Maple Leaf obviously had a lot of money. Uh, they would have invested a lot of money into the plant and in the town, into the infrastructure, uh, and they would have employed a lot more people. Um, that is, until a scandal broke out. Uh, so what happened was one of the executives of the Dow Company uh, and the manager of the Pakenham plant uh, were tasked with buying into wheat futures uh, on the commodity market. Uh, and they did so, uh, but they also threw in some of their own money. Uh, and then the market crashed and they lost everything and the company lost money as well. So they sort of uh, concocted some sneaky accounting uh, and wrote off their losses as that of the company's losses. Uh, and eventually they were caught, um, but the scandal was clearly not good for the mill uh, and it tanked the deal with Maple Leaf. Uh, so as a result, they had to pawn off the mill to uh, the second bidder, I guess, which was a company from Renfrew, uh, and that was the end of that. Uh, Dowd was shifting his business to the prairies, which by this point was developing, uh, and that was sort of the new future for, for grain. Uh, so anyone who wanted to buy a, a grain mill in Ontario is a bit of a sucker. Um, <laughs> so that continued until 1915, when the mill burned down one night. Uh, and put all 40 of its employees out of business. Uh, and after that, no one stepped up to rebuild the mill. Uh, it was wartime, money was short, people were short. Um, and so it was sort of the end of Pakenham's economy as a mill town. Uh, in this photo, which you can, it's a little blurry, but you can see the mills uh, are ruins at this point. This photo is from the 1920s. Uh, so you can see not even that long after the fire, uh, all the mills were gone. Um, everything was grown up into trees and bu bush. Uh, even the dam itself uh, looks like it's not even there anymore, or if it, it, or if it is, it's out of use. Um, so the decline of Pakenham was very quick. Uh, but the downfall of the Dowd Mill had other ramifications for Pakenham. Uh, most importantly, it was also the town's hydro generating station. So when it burned, Pakenham had no electricity for a couple months, uh, which I guess in 1915 wasn't as big of an issue as it would be today, um, but it was also the end of Pakenham as its own local hydro generating station. Uh, and there was a human cost as well. No one died in the fire, um, but at least two former employees who lost their jobs because of the fire uh, joined up uh, for the war effort uh, and were both killed overseas. So it did have some indirect consequences as well. Uh, so here's another photo. Uh, this is from the 1930s. So the mill was still around in ruins, uh, but you can see by this point, uh, the dam is gone. Everything else is gone. It's really these just these stone walls sticking up, uh, looking out over the water. So reporting on news stories, such as the Dowd Mill, was the Pakenham Transcript, which was Pakenham's one and only newspaper. Uh, and it didn't last very long. It wasn't very successful. Uh, only one uh, edition was ever known to be printed. Um, so it lasted about a week. Uh, there might have been more, um, but only one survived. Uh, and the story of the Pakenham Transcript uh, is quite interesting because it doesn't really focus on Pakenham at all. Uh, it was founded in 1899. Uh, it was published, I think, in June or July, um, the one copy, uh, by a man named William Pittard, uh, who was the owner and editor of the Almont Times. Uh, now, at this time, the Almont Times was competing against the Almont Gazette uh, for local readership, specifically in rural areas. Um, the Almont Gazette excelled at this because it not only focused on Almont, but it focused on regional news. Uh, so at this time, many local communities had their own column in the Almont Gazette. Uh, Pakenham had a very large column, 
uh, from the 1870s until about the 1970s. Uh, and every small community had uh, a personal section. Um, even, even communities as small as Antrim, Galetta, Carp, um, places like Benny's Corners, Cedar Hill, Scotch Corners, they all had uh, small columns and even places very far away. Uh, and so that's why you didn't even have to be from Almont to enjoy it and to subscribe to it. Uh, the Almont Times was not like this. Uh, it focused on Almont almost exclusively and it focused more on national and international news. Um, I guess you could say the Almont Gazette sort of targeted less sophisticated readers when it didn't focus on national news at all, just local news. Uh, but it, it was a winning strategy. Um, so at this time, Pittard decided that he would form the Pakenham transcript in order to undercut the Gazette in Pakenham and in other rural areas in the hope that people would uh, subscribe to the transcript instead. And all these articles uh, that you see on the front page, they're basically just copied and pasted from the Almont Times. Uh, so really he could just write one newspaper and publish two different ones uh, and hope to make more money. Uh, so here we have some advertisements for local businesses. Uh, Dominion Springs was uh, owned by the Gillen family, obviously. I'm, I'm sure some people have heard of them, uh, <laughs> being from Pakenham. Uh, and Dominion Springs was, at this time, basically a healing resort. Um, so people would go if they had illnesses uh, and they would bathe in the waters there that had supposedly mineral powers and all that. Uh, and it was supposed to cure whatever ailments you had. Um, obviously, if, the, if your uh, ailments didn't work out, uh, thankfully, they put the ad directly under another ad for an undertaker. Uh, so you could always visit the undertaker if, if uh, the springs weren't working for you. Uh, and on the right there, you see an ad for guests, guest instead, guest instead. Uh, and those were the owners of the roller mill that I was just talking about at the time in 1899. Uh, so a wide selection of local businesses were advertised in this paper. Uh, and of course, here we have the personal section. So here are some excerpts. There was one column uh, called News of the Churches. Uh, which is literally just a gossip column uh, about whatever gossip was picked up at church last Sunday. Uh, and the article that you see uh, up in the top left, uh, you might not be able to read. Well, I guess you can. But basically, it's about how uh, cows were roaming around the village, eating all the grass. Uh, and it sort of implies that there was manure everywhere. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it doesn't seem like much was happening in fact name at this time. Uh, but there was a lot of personal sections, uh, so the personal section was basically, uh, to summarize, it was so-and-so came to dinner the other night, or so-and-so uh, was visiting the other night. Uh, so we think social media is bad nowadays. Well, this was social media, but in paper form. Um, so as I mentioned, the pack name transcript didn't do so well, uh, and neither did the Almont Times. Uh, Pittard ran it until the 1920s when he gave it up. Uh, no one was willing to buy it at this time. Small town newspapers were obviously consolidating. Uh, he did become the mayor of Almont, so he sort of had a successful career outside of the paper. Um, but the paper was never revived uh, because in 1938, uh, Pittard died in a fire uh, after he fell asleep with his oil lantern still lit on the bedside table beside him. Uh, so that was the end of Pittard, and that was the end of the Pakenham transcript, for sure. But probably the biggest news story uh, in 1899 that wasn't covered uh, in the transcript uh, was the Boer War. Uh, it was Canada's first overseas conflict uh, and was fought between 1899 and 1902. The war played out between the British Commonwealth and the Boers who were Dutch colonists in South Africa uh, that were essentially rebelling against decades of British rule. Uh, there were at least two Pakenham boys who volunteered to go to South Africa. Uh, one was William Summerton, who's on the left. It's not a very good picture of him because it's a scan of a scan of a scan. Uh, it's the only picture I got. And the other one on the right is Arthur Gillen. Now, of the two, William Summerton was the only one to see combat, uh, and he was sort of a local celebrity uh, of a sort. Uh, he came, he was living out west at the time, but he came back to Pakenham before he went overseas, uh, and he was given a grand parade before he left. Uh, he was driven around the village in a wagon that was decorated with bunting and flags, 
uh, and local residents donated $70 to him uh, in case he ever needed cash when he was overseas. Uh, $70 is about $2,000 in today's money. Uh, so quite a bit just to give to someone who's going to war. Uh, he served in Lord Strathcona's horse, which was a famous cavalry regiment during the war, uh, and he saw action at many famous battles. But really what made him uh, such a local celebrity was that he wrote letters home, and those letters were published in the Almont Gazette. Uh, and it's really interesting to read these letters. I won't go into it because it'll take up too much time. Um, but these letters start off when he first arrived in South Africa. Uh, your, your typical new war letters, you know, I'll be home by Christmas, don't worry, we're going to get them. Uh, they don't stand a chance now that the Canadians are here, stuff like that. Uh, and as the war went on, uh, and as 1900 turned to 1901, uh, you can tell his letters, he becomes increasingly disillusioned with it all. Uh, his letters take on a much more negative tone. Uh, at one point, uh, he said something like, I'm dirty and ragged and I want to go home or something like that. Um, and he did come home, thankfully, just fine. Um, but it, his personality really bleeds through the page when you read these letters. And so basically everyone in Pakenham felt like they were with him in South Africa uh, and they really lived vicariously through his experiences. Uh, so when he arrived home, obviously being the local celebrity he it was, uh, they threw a big party, and I have an excerpt uh, from the Alma Gazette of that party. Uh, so it goes, On the arrival of the train, there was a volley of rousing cheers that drowned the band's musical welcome to the returning hero. Will was carried by a quartet of our young men into the station to greet his parents, brothers, and sisters, and then to the coach waiting to receive him, all amid the din of the music, the cracking of cannon and musketry. The procession was formed with four mounted men in charge, followed by the veteran volunteers, the brass band, the school children, about 130 in all, uh, with flags and badges cheering by the way. It was made one of the largest processions ever seen here. Obviously that's a bit of an exaggeration because what cannon and musketry? The cracking of cannon and musketry, no. Uh, that didn't happen, <laughs> um, but clearly it was uh, quite a big deal uh, when he was home, and he sort of went on a public speaking tour, I guess kind of like what I'm doing, uh, and they actually canceled school for a day so he could go into the school uh, in the village and uh, speak with all the children. Uh, so he was quite a local celebrity. Arthur Gillen's wartime experience uh, was not so good, uh, well, not so good for him, uh, he never saw combat because he arrived in South Africa a week after the war ended. Uh, so he kind of just hung out there for about a month and then they sent him home. Um, so that was really all his wartime experience. Uh, but the Boer War is a very forgotten episode in Canadian history. Uh, and it's a forgotten episode in Pakenham's history. So that's really why I wanted to touch on it here tonight. Uh, and so the story that really defined this period in Pakenham was the construction of the five-span bridge. Uh, and how can it not? It's honestly, truly our town's uh, most significant landmark. Uh, it always has been, uh, and it probably always will be. Uh, the bridge was built in the summer of 1901 uh, after the previous bridge was damaged by spring flooding. Does anyone want to guess how long it took to build the bridge? You can, just, you can just yell it out. Five years? Six months? Any other guesses? Five years, six months? Okay, well, it took, uh, it took about eight weeks, two months to the exact day. Uh, so it was built very quickly. Uh, it cost uh, $14,000 to build. Um, the cost rose a little bit because they had to build a temporary bridge. Uh, and the whole issue was actually very controversial and it was very divisive in town. Uh, it seemed like half the town was in favor of the bridge and half the town wasn't. Uh, and in fact, when they actually, there's a bug on me, I'm sorry. Um, when, they, when council voted uh, to build the bridge or not, um, the councillors uh, split the vote two to two and so the Reeve had to step in uh, and break the tie. Uh, and the newspaper makes it a little dramatic, but there was a bit of an awkward silence and finally, with a sigh, he said, let's build it. Uh, so construction started uh, on August 23rd and it finished on October 23rd. So exactly two months to the day. Um, the biggest issue with the bridge was where to build it. 
Uh, if you build it any closer to the dam, if you're looking at this photo, if you were to build it more to the left, uh, they feared that it would interfere with the water flow going towards the mills. Uh, the problem is if you build it further to the right, uh, you're driving literally into that hill, right? Uh, there's really not much room for any roads over there. Uh, and building it where the old one was wasn't much of an option because then you'd have to tear down the old one uh, and it would block traffic. Uh, so what to do? The option, the only option was to build it where the old bridge was and build a temporary bridge uh, in the meantime that people could cross. Uh, this was really the object of all the contention uh, and all the controversy because it was expensive. Uh, they were quoted an additional $4,000 to build uh, the bridge which council negotiated down. Uh, but this is an account of what it was, would have been like uh, in Pakenham in 1901 when they were talking about building the bridge. It goes, quite an amount of opposition has developed and great indignation is felt by many over the matter. Long and loud are the arguments at almost every street corner and hotel in the place. Young, old, and middle-aged are into it, and it is curious to notice how many super excellent engineers and bridge builders our town is blessed with. <laughs> so the author uh, obviously throwing a little bit of shade there. Um, but yes, it was very controversial, and it really shouldn't have been because they ended up building the temporary bridge in one day. Uh, and traffic on the old bridge, traffic was really only blocked across the river for a couple of, a couple of hours. Um, so it really was no inconvenience at all, uh, other than the fact that it cost a bit of money. Uh, about 70 men worked on the bridge while it was being built. Uh, they took the stones from the quarry that's on Kimbird Side Road there, just a few feet away, uh, and moved them using four large derricks, uh, basically these giant cranes. Uh, they were about 60 feet tall, uh, and they just moved the rocks from one location to the other. Uh, the crew would work all day and into the night. Um, obviously, they had to if they were going to finish uh, in two months. Um, so the man in charge, here's another view of the bridge. Uh, the man in charge of the project was an engineer named Robert Surtees. Uh, it would have been, I guess, a little disconcerting for the people of Pakenham to know that Robert Surtees had no formal education whatsoever. Uh, he was entirely self-educated, uh, and even though he did have decades as a civil engineer, he did everything by common sense and dead reckoning. Um, this is really one of the only f bridges he ever built, uh, and it was later in life. I think he only built one or two other bridges, uh, and they were much smaller than this. Uh, so that's a lot of trust to place in someone who doesn't have much of experience with what he's doing, uh, but it worked out in the end, obviously. Uh, and the bridge, again, was built in record time. Uh, they had about 16 weeks or four months to build it, uh, and they built it in half the time. Uh, so work obviously moved quickly. Um, but there's a bit of a postscript to the whole building of the bridge, uh, and that's when in the winter of 1903 and 1904, uh, work crews came back to Pakenham to work on the train bridge. Uh, the train bridge had been built before, and I'm not quite sure what they were doing, if they were rebuilding it or just building trusses across. Um, but there were, was a large work crew there uh, until in January of 1904, Pakenham was hit by a cold snap. Uh, the temperature plummeted to minus 40 and life came to a halt. Uh, the school was closed as it was too cold. The falls froze over solid and the mills had to be closed. Uh, and of course, work on the bridge ground to a halt. Uh, it was said that there was a housing shortage in Pakenham at this time and it only got worse because all these workers on the bridge needed somewhere warmer than the temporary accommodations they were living in. Uh, so they basically begged uh, anyone in town to take them in. Uh, and people were making a lot of money just charging people to sleep on the floor. Um, so it had some economic benefits, I suppose, this, uh, this cold snap. So while the town was divided uh, over the bridge issue, there was certainly a lighter side of life. Uh, starting in the 1890s, uh, it was the Victorian era, of course, uh, and so people were much more open uh, towards recreation and leisure, uh, and all sorts of new sports sort of evolved during this period. Uh, for example, we have hockey here. Uh, this is an early photo of a hockey team, probably from the 1900s, uh, and they were god-awful. Like, they were, they were so bad. Um, their first game was a game against Armprior in 1894, uh, and they tied, and that was their best game for five years. Uh, 
they, uh, the, the newspapers didn't report a Pakenham win until 1899, so they may or may not have lost for five years in a row. Uh, and they went from playing bigger towns at first, like Armprior and Almond and Carlton Place, uh, to playing smaller towns like Galetta and Kinburn and Clayton, smaller towns that they could beat up on. Uh, and the newspaper articles from this period are hilarious because it'll say something like, uh, the Arm Prior team challenged the Pakenham team to a home-and-home -home game. Uh, so they would go to Arm Prior, they'd lose. Uh, and then when Arm Prior showed up in Pakenham to play the game, the Pakenham players just disappeared. They didn't show up. Uh, they do stuff like this all the time. Uh, clearly, they won something here because they're all sitting around a table with the trophy. Uh, but for many years, Pakenham had a terrible hockey team. Uh, this is a basketball team, a women's basketball team. This photo was taken around 1911. And what's most interesting about this photo uh, was that we know exactly where it was taken. Uh, some of you might recognize the Almont Fairgrounds, that building uh, in the background. Uh, and there wasn't, there hasn't been much written about women's sports uh, at this time. Um, we know that tennis and cycling were very common for women uh, in the period because they could do it while wearing those big dresses, those big baggy dresses that they wore. Um, but cycling never seemed to take off in Pakenham. Uh, I recall there was a newspaper article mentioning how there were 11 bicycles in Blakeney, but only two in Pakenham. Um, and the author felt quite disappointed uh, in Pakenham for not buying more bicycles. Uh, a bicycle at this time cost about $200, which was a lot of money. Um, the average wage was about seven, six hundred dollars, so that was a lot of money. It was like buying a car uh, just to buy a bicycle. So that's probably why we only had two. Um, and of course another sport uh, that women uh, really took to was driving. Uh, automobiles were the new fad. Uh, the first one was built in, I mean bought in Pakenham in 1911 uh, by Jonathan Francis, the man who built the roller mill. Uh, but the second car was actually bought by a woman um, her husband had died, she inherited his money, so she spent it on a new car. Uh, and a family should just, I, I forget her name, but she would rip up and down the streets. Uh, very, very proud to show off this new car. Uh, and by 1915, there were 10 cars in Pakenham. Uh, so the fad took off quite quickly. But historically, the most popular and the oldest sport to be played in Pakenham was curling. Uh, this photo was taken in 1904 after the Pakenham Club won the Governor General's Cup. Uh, and that building in the background is the old club, the original one uh, on McFarland Street. Uh, curling was played in Pakenham since probably the 1840s or 50s on the river. Uh, Andrew Dixon popularized it uh, throughout Lanark County, being Scottish, of course. Uh, and he popularized it in Pakenham as well. Uh, this club. Um, survived until 1927 when it was torn down and for about a decade or so there there was no club uh, until the current one was built. It seems that curling has always been a very cyclical game or generational game in Pakenham. Uh, it seems like one generation takes to curling and loves it uh, and then the next generation doesn't quite love it so much so it sort of uh, goes in peaks and troughs. But the Pakenham Curling Club was the scene of one special visitor in 1908. Uh, and that was when Sir Robert Borden, the man on the left, uh, visited Pakenham in advance of the 1908 federal election. Uh, Robert Borden of this time was the leader of the Conservative Party uh, and the leader of the official opposition, and he would become Prime Minister in 1911. Um, at this time, he was still, of course, the opposition leader. Uh, so he was invited to attend a rally in Pakenham, uh, and his host was the local member of Parliament, William Thoburn, uh, who had actually grown up in Pakenham. Uh, he lived here until he was about 18. Uh, then he went to Almont and made a fortune in the milling industry. If you ever go down Union Street in Almont, where all those big old houses are, uh, one of those is his. Um, so he made quite a bit of money there, but he never forgot about his hometown in Pakenham. Uh, so he was invited by William Thoburn, and a big crowd awaited Robert Borden when he got to the train station. Uh, so this is an account of him arriving. It says, on the arrival of the morning train, the party was met at the depot, which is pictured here. Uh, a procession was formed with prancing horsemen in the front and a number of carriages following in the rear, and a circuit was made of the town. 
When proceeding to the curling rink, the horses were, remo were removed from the carriage in which Mr. Borden was sitting, and several of his enthusiastic political admirers hauled the conveyance to its destiny. The Elmont Brass Band was in attendance and furnished music for the parade. Uh, so I'll leave you with the image of the future Prime Minister uh, coming down the corner here and going through Pakenham's muddy streets uh, on his way to the curling club. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I have for tonight. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, I did write a book, obviously, um, and it has many different topics. The topics that I cover tonight cover two halves of a chapter. Each chapter is about a decade, uh, and there's 21 chapters. Uh, so there's much more to read uh, if you're interested. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I have for tonight. I don't know if that was too long or too quick. Uh, just wait, Zoe. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's everything. If anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to come up and ask them. Thank you. I'll be around too, so if people are a little shy to use the mic, you can always just come up and talk to me. Oh, here comes Doris. Oh, she's coming to give me a hug. Do you want a hug? No, but I just expect one. <laughs> so, if there's no questions, yeah. I'll just uh, thank you, Robert. I know he spent Lots of time preparing for this evening. Great slide, so happy for that. Um, so um, Robert will be around, and he does. Um, so you didn't sp speak about your book that much. It's due in early March, end of February. Yeah. And he has order forms at the back door if you're interested. If they're in there. Oh, they're in here. Okay. The oh, they're there too. So anyway. Um, so before I give Robert a send-off, I will. Um, one of the reasons why the, the book is, um, has a date to 2023 is because this is uh, Pakenham's bicentennial year, as well as Ramsey Township. And um, I'm not sure what date Elmont is celebrating, but we're all celebrating. So, um, but I'm also on the Bicentennial Committee and we want, we'll be soon sending out notices to save the date for a weekend in August, the 18th, 19th and 20th, where we will be having um, celebrations, a dance, um, other activities, and hopefully um, people will come home to Pakenham for that weekend. And there might be other activities throughout the year, and certainly the uh, municipality will be um, sponsoring some as well. So um, with that, I'll just say thank you very much, Robert. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So please join us next door for some tea and coffee and some treats, and Robert will be around if you want to ask questions. Good. Thank you. I'll take the note.